start then. So hello everyone and welcome to the Hall Age Strategy Webinar. Um, I'm Owen Plant of Tool, an Associate Professor at Edinburgh Napier uh, University and I will be your moderator for today's webinar session. Um, just to note, uh, the session has been recorded, um, just to make that you aware of that. And um, we will have quite a number of speakers, quite an action-packed um, element here today. So we will have to be quite tight in relation to time. So you're all very welcome. Thank you very much for attending today's session to the participants. And also very welcome as well to the presenters and the speakers today for giving their time to us for this stimulating and action-packed um, um, approach to this particular webinar. So we have quite a variety of different perspectives in today's speakers in terms of the policy perspective, we have the, the researcher perspective, and also the industry perspective as well. So it's quite an interesting combination of different elements. And I'm hoping you'll find it stimulating. It looks um, very stimulating from my perspective. And I'm really looking forward to some of the speakers and some of the talks today. Um, so just in terms of some housekeeping, um, we will be taking questions for most of the presentations. Um, if you could post your questions in the chat box, please. And um, we have a couple of moments to go through some questions and put them to the speakers um, at the end of their presentation. So we take them as we go through um, the webinar session itself. If we don't have time, because we have quite a lot to fit in, um, and we don't have time to address the questions, we will follow up. So the department will follow up directly with the speakers and come back to you with answers to your particular question there. But let's see how we go time frame wise, and we might manage to get through all, all of the questions today. Um, so we have quite an action packed agenda. So just to quite quickly outline some of those, we'll have an initial address uh, by the Minister of State for Transport, Hildegard Nocton. Um, this will be followed then by Claire Martinez for road transport outlining the current public consultation call um, to develop the 10-year strategy and um, which is aligned with the programme for work for, for the government. This will be followed by 10.30. We'll be setting the scene by Professor Alan McKinnon, improving the economic efficiency and environmental sustainability of road haulage. And Mark BA will follow on at 10.55, the European perspective and the EU-wide HGV driver shortages. And we will allow a short comfort break then at 11.20, just for 10 minutes, just to stretch your legs, um, because three hour block is quite a long time to spend in, in front of the screen. Um, 11.30, about then we will return and we will get then Chris Smith from the Perennial Freight, who will look at it from the viewers from a licensed hauliers operator perspective. And again, there'll be a couple of minutes for, for questions there. 11.50, we have um, Professor Brian O'Gallacore um, from Decarbonisation Opportunities and Challenges for the Road Haulage Sector. Um, 12.10, then we have the overview from Transport Infrastructure Ireland by Helen Hughes, uh, Director of Professional Services. And then the final presentation um, will be from Sabrina Zhang and also Nicholas Valentasis at TU Dublin on urban logistics and decarbonisation. And I'll wrap up then at 12.50. So aiming to finish up around 1, 1 p.m. around that particular point of time. And so as you can see, there's quite a lot to get through. So we will be uh, relatively uh, tight on time, but it does seem like a very interesting, stimulating and action-packed agenda. So without uh, further ado, um, what I will do is hand over to our first speaker. Um, I would like to introduce um, to you Hildegard Nocton, TD, is the Minister of State at the Department of Transport and Special Responsibility for International and Road Transport and Logistics. She is also Minister of State at the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications with special responsibility for postal policy and air codes, and Minister of State at the Department of Justice with special responsibility for civil and criminal justice. So Minister Nocton, please, if we'd I'd like to um, hand it over to you um, to hear your address. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Owen, and good morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to this morning's webinar. As you may know that in line with the Programme for Government, my department is working on developing a 10-year strategy for the road haulage sector. And the aim is to develop a strategy that will focus on generating efficiencies and improving standards, addressing the skills shortage and helping the sector move to a low carbon future. So the public consultation document was published in April, and that was 
the first step in this process. So I wanted to bring everyone together this morning so that we could hear from a number of interesting speakers on a number of different but interrelated topics in the hope that this will generate some further thought and discussion on what you want to see in the forthcoming 10 year strategy. So I would urge everyone here this morning to make a submission on that strategy. And I would stress that any and all suggestions are welcome. I want to hear from you who are the experts in your own fields on what you think is required. And I'd like you to just draw on best national and international practice in order to help us develop a haulage strategy that is ambitious, achievable, and which will allow for the most efficient movement of goods while also being an attractive career option. The initial consultation document published in April outlines several topics and you will have seen that we've had we've a very busy agenda this morning as Owen has outlined, so we hope to have time for some Q&A after we've heard from each speaker and if we don't get to every question that's asked we will endeavour to follow up with you on the questions that you've raised and get back to all the participants. So with that busy, busy agenda in mind, I'll just focus on a few of the issues that were covered in the initial consultation document um, and and the views that we want to hear from yourselves. So I have a very strong interest in the skills gap that's currently facing the sector here in Ireland. And a section of the haulage strategy consultation document outlines the labor shortage and the skills challenges facing the sector. The HGV driver shortage in particular is becoming more acute across Europe. And I'm aware that Irish road transport operators are finding it increasingly difficult to recruit and retain HGV drivers. The ageing profile of HGV drivers and the difficulties that we know haulage operators face in recruiting drivers remains a concern. There are a number of initiatives underway to address this, very much driven by the haulage representative organisations and other key stakeholders, but more work is needed and I want to hear your views on how we can assist or work together to help to, help to address this. On foot of key recommendations from the expert group on future skills needs, the Department of Transport established and currently chairs the Logistics and Supply Chain Skills Group. The primary aim of this group is to work together to better support the promotion of careers, skills development and sustainable employment in the logistics and supply chain sector in Ireland. A number of you here today are very active members of that group and you're involved in the work of its two subgroups and have put much time into the skills piece in recent years. The promotion of careers and sustainable employment in the sector, together with skills development and career progression for existing workers through training and education is crucial. There are some excellent examples of stakeholders coming together to develop and roll out courses such as uh, the Logistics Associate Apprenticeship and HGV Driver Training Programme, but real challenges still remain. And given, given the increasing difficulties in recruiting HGV drivers, it's clear that more must be done and that we must work together towards enhancing the perception of a career in the road haulage and logistics sector in order to attract and importantly, to retain talent. There are a number of strands to this challenge, and I'd very much welcome your views on this as part of the submissions to the department on that 10 year strategy. I want to thank those of you who've already fed in views on some of the issues that have uh, that may be contributing to that driver shortage, including in relation to difficulties in recruiting drivers from outside of Ireland and outside of the EU. It would be most informative to hear from haulage operators that may have had recent successes in recruiting new drivers to the sector also. I look forward to hearing from Mark from the IRU on, on this important matter later this morning as the skills and driver shortage issue affects many, many other EU member states. The sustainability and decarbonisation challenge facing the road haulage industry is one of the key issues that needs to be addressed by this 10 year strategy. The science is unequivocal on climate change. We must urgently deliver ambitious and effective emission reduction measures to achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement and ultimately stabilise global temperatures. Like many, I was heartened by the recent renewed commitment of the, United States, of the United States to the Paris Agreement and by the G7 nations promising to collectively cut emissions in half by 2030. Momentum is gathering and tackling climate change is rightly in the global spotlight. In Ireland, the transport sector accounts for a little over 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions. There can be no doubt that transport has a significant role to play in our national decarbonisation efforts. 
The HGV sector is responsible for approximately 16% of transport emissions. It's the second biggest emitter behind the private car. And with growth in freight movements expected to continue over the coming years, decarbonizing the sector will be key in helping Ireland achieve its climate ambitions of having transport emissions by 2030 and reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. We need to act to take emissions out of the movement uh, of people and goods more quickly than we have ever envisaged before. And simult simultaneously, we must break the link between fossil fuel use and economic progress. If done correctly, this green transformation can provide us with an opportunity to modernize and strengthen the commercial road haulage sector, ensuring that it continues to stay competitive and fit for purpose. It will be important that the increase in climate ambition is achieved in a manner that balances considerations of fairness, cost effectiveness and solidarity, ensuring that nobody is left behind. The programme for government reflects the scale of our ambition with the commitment to reduce emissions by an average of 7% per annum over the coming decade and to achieve net zero by 2050. This is the minimum the science tell us, tells us is necessary to begin to address climate change. The 2050 target will be set in law through the, pen, the pending Climate Action Bill. Another key step will be the Climate Action Plan, due to be published later this summer, which will set out actions that must be taken to ensure that we deliver on our climate commitments. I'm grateful for the engagement and the interest of the haulage sector in working towards and sharing these fundamental priorities, while also acknowledging the significant challenges. It's no easy task and we, it will require institutional, political and behavioural change from all. However, the benefits will help to drive the economy and bring about a healthier and more sustainable future. In March this year, I was delighted to announce a new grant scheme to help with the purchase of lower emitting alternatively fueled HGVs. And interest in that grant scheme has been remarkable, showing the willingness of the transport, the road transport industry to embrace new technologies and greener work practices. This grant is just one of the measures introduced by government to support freight decarbonisation. Others include a reduced toll regime, as well as a wear and tear capital allowance scheme for alternatively fueled trucks. There are other measures that some of you here today are also working on. Many of you here this morning have also fed into ongoing work across government departments on this topic. And I'd warmly welcome your suggestions on how to accelerate climate action within freight as part of our work on that 10 year strategy for the road haulage sector. Professors Alan McKinnon and Brian O'Gallagher will also discuss these challenges in more detail over the course of this morning. This morning's agenda will also feature presentations on road freight data and uh, service areas from TII, as well as on urban logistics from TU Dublin. Chris Smith from Perennial Freight will share his views on the licensed haulage sector, which brings me to my main ask of you all here today. Where do we want the sector to be and what do we want the sector to look like in 10 years time? Again, I'm, I'm asking you all to make submissions to the department on foot of the initial public consultation document, which was published in April. The deadline for submissions is the 2nd of July. So I hope that this morning's presentations generate some food for thought, and I very much look forward to receiving your submissions. And again, uh, we want to hear from anyone involved in the road haulage sector or the wider logistics industry. I want to hear your ideas and what you want to see in this 10 year strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that address. Um, some very important issues raised and some very important questions that hopefully we will debate and discuss um, more in depth. Um, we'll move quickly along to Claire Martinez, Road Transport and Freight Policy Division at Department of Transport, is going to outline um, a presentation on the forthcoming 10-year haulage sector strategy. Claire, over to you. Thank you, Owen. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Claire Martinez and I work in the Road Transport and Freight Policy Division in the Department of Transport. Um, and together with my colleagues, Isabel Baker and Niall Curran, we're working on the forthcoming 10 year strategy for the sector. So I'm going to just run through in brief some of the next steps in the development of the strategy and outline also what we want to achieve from this, this work. Um, so Minister Nocton mentioned that she published the initial consultation document back in April. So we're very much only in the first phase of what will be um, a two phase public consultation. So the initial paper, which some of you will have hopefully read, um, 
poses a number of questions to readers and covers quite a few topics, um, but we'd welcome <coughs> excuse me, submissions that raise um, any other issues that you feel might be missing from the document and that you think might assist in developing the appropriate policies for the sector. So you're not confined in any way um, by the questions that we've posed in that paper. They're there just as a guide. Um, and similarly, if you wish to make a submission on just one element, um, such as training or skills or road safety, then that's absolutely fine too. So the public consultation document, as many of you are aware, is available on our website. Um, to make a submission, we're asking people to email responses to the haulage strategy mailbox, which is the email address that you'd have received the details on this webinar from, or you can post submissions directly to the department on Lease and Lane as well. And if anyone has any queries regarding the consultation process, um, we'd ask that you email us at that email address as well. Um, the deadline, as the Minister mentioned, uh, for the receipt of submissions is the 2nd of July, so it's about two and a half weeks from now. Um, and I'm just going to outline some of the next steps um, in, in the process. So following the receipt of submissions, um, the department will then review and consider all of the submissions received and a draft 10 year strategy will be worked on and it'll be published later on in the year, taking account of the submissions received. And we'll no doubt again be coming back to seek your views on that draft. So the intention is then that the final 10 year strategy will be published by the end of this year. And following on from today's webinar, um, we, set, we hope to myself and Isabel just to circulate a very short summary of today's session to all participants. And we are very much looking forward to receiving your submissions as well. Um, so I'll just say a bit more about the objectives for the strategy too. Um, we want to, I suppose, concentrate in the development of the strategy on how government, industry, um, academic and training providers and others can really work together to improve efficiencies and standards, helping the sector move to a more low carbon future over the short to medium term. And that'll help to ensure the safe and efficient movement um, of goods by road, while at the same time, you know, minimizing the impact on the environment and ensuring that the sector continues to meet high standards of compliance with EU and domestic legislation and so on. And Minister Nocton has spoken just now about how decarbonising the sector does pose a particular challenge. So we will hear more on this topic from some of our other speakers this morning. Um, and this is, of course, a really key topic for the strategy, but the intention is that the strategy will actually cover many other elements in addition to decarbonisation. So that's why we're trying to cover quite a few different topics over the course of this morning's webinar. So the skills gap and the ongoing um, HGV driver shortage is really a huge challenge, as Minister Nocton's just outlined, and as many of you here today are already aware of, given you know, the difficulties that road transport operators are currently faced with. So we really want your views on that. Um, and thanks to those of you that have already sent in some recent um, emails and submissions on those issues. Um, but I think we also need to take account of just the makeup of our haulage fleet in Ireland. And this is detailed in the consultation document. So many of our road haulage operators and the majority of the vehicles um, owned by those operators are licensed to operate internationally as well as nationally. So those working internationally might have quite different concerns, you know, um, for example, in relation to the types of vehicle that they might choose to invest in and so on, particularly when it comes to the decarbonisation agenda. So, and we know as well, obviously, that our fleet is ageing. So we'd welcome submissions on this aspect too. Um, the initial consultation document as well, just to mention, um, details the ongoing Brexit and COVID related challenges facing the sector and outlines other um, important policy issues such as road safety, infrastructure, labour market and integrated transport topics, some of which our speakers will also um, touch on today. So uh, I know we have a lot to get through um, and we want to have time for uh, questions um, to, to our panellists and so on. So I hope that, that provides just some clarity on the process around the strategy over the next few months. Um, we'll very much keep in touch with all of you um, following the receipt of submissions and the, the drafting of the initial strategy document. Um, and if anyone has queries, just to get in touch with us. Um, so Owen, I will hand back over to you now. Thank you. 
Thanks, Claire. Um, thanks for outlining an overview and stressing the importance it is to get, to get a variety of views from many different um, parts of the industry and sector um, to feed into this important strategy going forward and to development of the haulage, haulage sector. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, we're going to go to our next speaker, Professor Alan McKinnon. Uh, he's Professor of Logistics at KLU um, in Hamburg and also Professor Emeritus at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, so not too far from myself where I am at the moment, Alan. And Alan's going to present on setting the scene, improving the economic efficiency and environmental sustainability of road haulage. So we're very much looking forward uh, to this presentation. Alan, if you have some slides, would you like to share your screen with us? We can see your screen and you're still on, on mute. I can unmute you if you. Oh, I don't think I can unmute you. Maybe Isabel could unmute you if you. Can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you now. Yes, perfect. That's good. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, I had just a bit of difficulty on muting. Okay, well, uh, th thank you for that introduction and, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, although I work in Hamburg, I'm actually um, in Edinburgh at the moment. My home is there. I'm part of the Celtic uh, fringe. Um, so I've packed quite a lot into this uh, presentation. Um, so I'll uh, I hope you find this of interest. And I see this very much as a scene setter, really, for your, uh, for your workshop. But I'd start just by saying a few things about the haulage industry in general. Um, it's got a series of defining characteristics which you find virtually everywhere, okay? Industry with low barriers to entry, very few economies of scale, it's highly fragmented, um, intensely competitive. Uh, some people portray road haulage as, as, as almost as close as you get to perfect competition. Uh, regrettably, many of the customers of this industry see road haulage as a commodity service. Um, it, it operates on very low profit margins, very high level of subcontracting, uh, particularly by larger logistics providers, um, and, and also significant underutilization of vehicle capacity. Um, and that may seem strange because you would have thought if this is such a competitive industry that the, the carriers would, would be making maximum use of their vehicles. But if you look at the empty running statistics, the average loading of vehicles, average fuel efficiency, there's huge potential for increasing those, uh, those parameters. Um, why is that? Well, I think it seems to me that a lot of the operational inefficiency in road haulage um, is a result of the hauliers trying to meet their clients' requirements. It, it's because of market conditions. It's because of the way in which we manage our logistics that then impacts on the load factors of the, of the vehicles. Another, I think, important point worth making is that given the intense competition in this industry, it's quite natural that carriers prioritize commercial performance, or in many cases, just business survival over uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, so in this presentation, I'm going to be looking at both efficiency and sustainability because these two things are intimately linked, uh, clearly. Um, just mention a survey that um, uh, my university did in association with the Smart Freight Centre and, and a company called Historian uh, last year, a uh, survey of 800 small and medium-sized uh, road hauliers across Europe. Um, you can download that report, I'll give you the link uh, later. Um, and one question we asked was how much priority these carriers felt should be attached to the decarbonisation of the road freight sector. Um, and also how important uh, fuel efficiency was to their long-term strategy. And as you can see, in both cases, um, you know, very high priority was attached by this large sample of carriers. Um, but then when we probe more deeply, we, we found that in their day-to-day -day operations, um, certainly decarbonisation did not feature very prominently because their um, operations were very much dominated by, by the commercial requirements. Uh, another question we asked was how much business opportunity they saw in improving the environmental sustainability of their operations. 
Um, and again, unfortunately, the results were a bit negative. So uh, just over half of the carriers consulted said they could see little or no um, business benefit in that, which I, I partly think is, is in terms of their perception of how this will increase the revenue side of their balance sheet. I think that there's no dispute that much of what you do to cut emissions in wood haulage will also save you money, right? This is this low hanging fruit. So on the cost side, there are unquestionable benefits, but I think many of these carriers were possibly expecting their clients to pay them more for a more environmentally friendly service. And as yet, there's little evidence of, of that happening. Um, I'd also like just to put some of this into perspective. Um, the, the minister mentioned the importance of decarbonizing road haulage, and we have to do this dramatically and urgently to stay within our carbon reduction targets. Um, so if we look at this at a European level, and, and you know, Ireland is still very lucky to be a member of the EU still, um, uh, the EU wants to reduce emissions from transport by 90% by 2050. Now let's look at how we might achieve that in the road haulage sector. Here's one scenario. If, if we shifted about a third of road town kilometres to rail, and in the meantime, rail improved its uh, carbon efficiency, um, a 25% reduction, 25% uh, improvement in the efficiency of the routing of vehicles, 30% improvement in the loading of laden vehicles, 30% reduction in the empty running of trucks, 50% improvement in their average energy efficiency, and a 60% drop in the carbon content of that truck energy. Factoring all of those things together would deliver your 90% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions. Now, that's just one scenario. Uh, you, you could obviously uh, alter the relative importance attached to those parameters. Uh, but the key thing is that whatever we do, we've got to do it quickly. Because let's suppose we allow road haulage emissions to continue to rise until 2025, and then they peak at that point, and then they drop steeply thereafter. And we compare that with another scenario where we, we don't see those emissions peaking until 2035. Um, it, over that 10 year period, we would put about one third more CO2 into the atmosphere from the road haulage sector. And as I'm sure you're all aware, it's the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which is driving climate change. So how do we do that? Well, um, unfortunately, it's going to take us a long time to transform our road haulage fleet in Europe from uh, internal combustion engines to the new generation of low carbon vehicles using batteries or hydrogen fuel cells or overhead cables. I mean, in 2017, using the data from that year, it would take us between 13 and 14 years to replace the truck fleet. Um, and it's unlikely we're going to see mass production of these low carbon trucks until the mid 2020s at the earliest. Um, and then of course, there'll be a, a long period of market uptake. In other words, we simply cannot wait until this new generation of low carbon vehicles comes along for us to decarbonize this sector. Therefore, it seems to me, we have to focus on what I call the mall, uh, the managerial, operational and behavioral initiatives. Um, and these are the things I'm going to be focusing on in this uh, presentation. Um, why focus on these mob options? Uh, well, they're faster to implement. Um, most of them yield an economic as well as environmental benefit. So they're low hanging fruit in that sense. And, and most of them have a relatively low capital investment. But what that requires is a change of business practice, a change in operation, operating procedures, a build up in the skill levels in the sector, and also a change in corporate mindsets uh, as well. Now, this has not been much studied over the years. There's been a lot of research in recent years looking at the economic and, and uh, carbon impacts of new technology in the road freight sector. I'm aware really of only two studies which have tried to model the effect of these managerial and behavioral factors. One was the International Energy Agency study in 2017, Another one was the Energy Transition Commission work, um, where they actually quantified what they thought would be the uh, savings in fuel and emissions uh, from these uh, softer managerial options. And in both cases, they, they were actually quite positive and optimistic that these could yield significant benefits. The pro that's the future. The problem is, if you look at the past, 
Um, this data relates to the UK. Again, I don't have similar data for Ireland. Um, but if you look at the trends in some of these key parameters, so at the top, we're looking at the average weight-based loading factor of vehicles. In the middle, we've got the average fuel efficiency of trucks in the UK. And at the bottom, we've got the proportion of truck kilometers run empty. Um, so in, in the top two cases, there's no obvious improvement. Things bump along. Um, and in the case of empty running, we've actually seen an increase in the proportion of empty running in the UK. So because of that, many commentators in this field are a bit pessimistic about the contribution that these managerial operational and behavioral measures will make, partly based on past experience. Um, so um, why is that? Well, it seems to me because there are lots of factors constraining improvements in vehicle utilization. Um, I've published various papers on this. I mean, the, I've, I've encapsulated that really in this diagram where I, I flag up um, 11 uh, major constraints on the loading of vehicles. And as you can see, I've grouped them into uh, five categories. Uh, and uh, I know I don't have time here to discuss all of these in details, in detail, but I, I, I would um, highlight a few of them. And one, one is just the degree of variability in the road haulage sector. The demands are fairly volatile from day to day, making it very hard to manage capacity. Um, there's, in the case of backloading, a lack of knowledge of the available backloads. Um, we've got a lot of unreliability in these systems. We've got just-in-time delivery, which I'll say more about later. Uh, many environmentalists uh, feel that it's just-in-time delivery, which is constraining the loading of, uh, of vehicles. Uh, we've also got geographical imbalances in the pattern of freight flow, which makes it hard to fill the vehicles all of the time. Just on that field, on, on that subject, I'll, I'll refer back to some research that we did in the UK. This was about 16 years ago, when on, on one off, we, we got access to this amazing data set um, of about 900 lorry journeys made over a 48 hour period in the food supply chain in the UK. And we were able then to reconstruct all of those journeys to see what the potential might have been for reducing empty running. And unfortunately, the results of that analysis were rather pessimistic um, because overall we found, I think there were almost 600 um, potential backloads uh, for empty vehicles. Um, but then when we applied a series of operational filters, um, we discovered that the proportion of empty journeys that could have been eliminated dropped quite dramatically. Once you look at the, the, the actual locations of the backloads, the compatibility of the vehicles, vehicle capacity, the time schedules within which the hauliers were operating, uh, you discovered that, that what seemed initially to be a large potential for reducing empty running in practice really wasn't, uh, wasn't practical. Um, that's empty vehicles. What about those vehicles that are loaded? Um, this is very hard to research because we really lack good data on the loading of vehicles. Most of the data we currently have relates to the weight-based loading of the vehicles. Um, we have very little data anywhere on the volumetric utilization of vehicle capacity, either in a two-dimensional sense in terms of the loading of the floor area or in a three-dimensional sense in terms of the of the height. I mean, it'd be so ideal if we could only put glass sides on trucks, you know, so we could see exactly how well filled they actually are. Now, th this is very important because the density of road freight varies enormously. You know, in this example, it's from polystyrene foam at one end to steel at the other. Now, if, if you want to fill a 40-ton truck, um, by weight and by volume simultaneously, then you're looking at an average density, I think of about um, 0.36 of a ton uh, per cubic meter, uh, which is roughly sort of average load of groceries, uh, for example. Um, but, but of course, a lot of vehicles don't achieve that. So some of them cube out, others weigh out. Um, and we really have very little data on, on the mix of uh, road freight operations that fall into those categories. And then we could even drill down further. I mean, at what level do we monitor the utilization of trucks? Um, do we do it at a vehicle level or in terms of the loading of the handling equipment? Or do we go down even to the level of packaging and to the design of the product uh, as well? Because there's no question there's a, a number of utilization of capacity in the road freight sector at, at all of these levels. Um, 
But why don't we just correct this? Well, one obvious thing we can do is to promote supply chain collaboration. Uh, there is a general agreement that if we're going to achieve deep reductions in carbon emissions from freight transport, then we're going to have to see greater sharing of vehicle capacity. Just to illustrate the benefits of that, um, this uh, was the result of a, an analysis done as part of an EU project called CO3, um, relating to two uh, big uh, FMCG companies, Nestle and PepsiCo, at the, looking at their operations in the Benelux countries. So initially, the two countries, the two companies, um, had completely separate road freight operations. Uh, at stage two, they uh, used the same logistics provider where they so combined their loads. Um, and then at the third stage, they engaged in what we call collaborative synchronization, where the companies adjusted their schedules to maximize loading opportunities. And this was all carbon footprinted. And as you can see, by moving from stage one to stage three, you were able to cut emissions per ton of product delivered by, by more than 50%. Um, so uh, we need to see an increase in, in collaboration between companies to make better use of capacity. Um, currently, that collaboration is the exception rather than the rule. Now, some people are looking forward um, to something called the physical internet. In fact, yesterday and today, the International Physical Internet Conference is, is, is happening. Um, th this is um, not the Internet of Things. Um, the physical internet is an attempt to create in the real world of logistics um, something comparable to the digital internet, where you've got open systems, um, collaboration, maximum sharing of assets, um, standardized modularization of containers. And some people, this is often seen as the vision of the future of logistics in Europe. And if it were ever to be achieved, it would um, allow us to make much better use of vehicle capacity. It used to be that people said this is a 2050 vision, um, but in recent years, people have been suggesting that this can be delivered a bit more rapidly. Um, but that's for the future. I mean, there are other things we can be doing in the meantime. Another development which I think could help us improve the efficiency and sustainability of road freight um, is to relax size and weight constraints on trucks, as indeed has happened in many uh, EU countries um, since 2013. Um, that allows us then to consolidate loads better. We could move from a, from, uh, we could replace uh, three vehicles with two, uh, yielding reductions in vehicle kilometers, uh, fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. Um, across the water here in the, in the UK. Um, we haven't gone for uh, these uh, longer vehicles going up to 25 meters, um, but what we have done is relax the length of uh, semi-trailers um, to make it possible to carry up to 15% more pallets. This has been a trial, it's been monitored and, and it's been shown to cut costs and also to reduce uh, emissions. But the main way in which the UK, it seems to me, has derived efficiency and sustainability benefits from enlarging vehicles is, is vertically um, by making the vehicles taller. Now this depends of course on the height of your road infrastructure. Um, the UK is quite lucky, believe it or not, there is no height limit for trucks in the UK, but by custom and practice, you don't go above 4.9 meters or you start to hit motorway bridges. But even in Ireland, you've got relatively high height clearances uh, over, over vehicles. Um, and you know the studies done in the UK, we reckon we've now got about 20,000 of these double deck trailers in the UK, um, you know, saving money and uh, cutting emissions. And even elsewhere in Europe, where there's a four meter height limit, as in the Netherlands, it is possible to double deck um, by lowering the floor of the vehicle rather than increasing its height. Another thing which is going to help us improve the efficiency of road haulage is digitalization. Um, the, the term that's now used for a whole array of um, IT and, and artificial intelligence developments. Um, my university conducted a survey last year of 90 senior executives in logistics across Europe. And one question we asked them was what effect digitalization was likely to have on logistics over the next five years. And as you can see, there was a resounding message that it's going to be have a transformational effect on the way in which we manage logistics. Um, and there's no question that it's going to help us to improve the efficiency with which we operate our vehicles. Nobody as yet, to my knowledge, has quantified the overall effect of that on efficiency and sustainability. But um, I think the combined effect of all the things you see on that slide there um, are, are going to be very positive. 
Um, then we come to just in time, which I mentioned earlier, a much criticism leveled at the just in time principle uh, for underloading vehicles. Um, and so many environmentalists are saying in a low carbon world, we can no longer tolerate just in time. Um, but I think we've got to be careful about this. I mean, the argument is if you relax just in time schedules, it would give companies more time to consolidate loads and to find back loads. And it would also permit a shift of freight to lower carbon modes like rail and water. But we've got to be careful because just in time is not just a stop control principle. It is a whole business philosophy designed to minimize waste. And that also includes the waste of energy uh, within production and warehousing facilities. So, so it may allow us to cut emissions in on the transport side, but until we've done a full life cycle analysis, a holistic analysis of the net effects of just in time on energy and CO2, I think we should be cautious. But there are other things we can do. I mean, I published a paper in 2016 suggesting that we should decelerate um, freight transport um, to save energy and to cut emissions. And, and you know, again, it would take me 20 minutes to discuss this one diagram, but just to sum it up very briefly, what this does is look at the relationship between CO2 emissions and the process time in a supply chain. So in processing a customer order, there are about 10 things you have to do, and nine of those things are within the factories, the warehouses, and the shops. Um, the, the exception is transport, um, and that is by far the most carbon intensity of these activities. So if we slow down the transport, um, we would then save you know, on emissions. And in the meantime, we could accelerate those non-transport activities within the buildings so that that would compensate them for any increased transit time. Um, some people think this is heresy, but I think it's something we really have to give some serious thought to. Um, then moving away from loading the vehicles, just very briefly to look at what we can do to improve the energy efficiency of the vehicles. Um, clearly, there will be major advances in vehicle technology, not just switching to alternative energy sources, but also improving the energy efficiency of the vehicles. We can retrofit vehicles in various ways to save energy. Improving vehicle maintenance standards would help. One of the most cost-effective ways of decarbonizing uh, road freight is driver training. And, and coupling that with telematric monitoring of driver performance and then giving drivers guidance on how they can improve their efficiency. Um, and it's not just the vehicle engine that matters here, it's also the ancillary equipment like the refrigeration units um, where we can improve efficiency and cut sustainability. Looking to the longer term, we may make more use of the platooning of vehicles, linking them together with electronic tow bars, if you like, to, maximize their fuel efficiency as a, as a convoy rather than an individual vehicle. Truck automation, I think in the longer term will help, but again, that's a, a rather distant prospect. And then I mentioned earlier, simply slowing down the vehicles. The, the, the sort of fuel efficiency and carbon efficiency sweet spot for trucks is some way below the current average speed at which trucks travel. And already we, we've seen some large logistics providers reducing the, the, the speed on the on the governors on the engine to uh, it's both to save fuel and to cut uh, emissions and then um, another thing we can do is to reschedule deliveries um, i'll just open out this whole slide um, a, a research that's been done has shown just how high the fuel and co2 penalty is in running trucks on congested roads you can see the figures there for a study that was done in germany some years ago where if the vehicle is to stop in congested roads, you really do bump up the, the um, fuel consumption. And now there was a study done in the UK by a former research centre here in, in Edinburgh, um, where they got data from the highways agency in the UK uh, to do this modelling work, where what they did was they, they looked at vehicles making a, a random selection of trips across the UK, uh, leaving at different times in the day, and they then optimised the routing uh, and they, they also allowed for the difference in fuel efficiency, reflecting the traffic conditions at different times in the day. And, and as, as a result, they looked at the impact of rescheduling on the distance that we traveled, the CO2 emissions, the time it would take, and also the cost of the haulage operation. And, and just by looking at the profile on those graphs, you can see the benefits that you get by making more use of the road network at off-peak periods. Um, there's also been work done uh, at an urban level on this, looking at re uh, rescheduling deliveries in urban areas, suggesting that there are 
significant CO2 and fuel savings from that. But there are constraints. One is currently the very close coupling of production and logistics operations, making it difficult often to do that rescheduling. There's also concern about the noise disturbance where you deliver near, urban, near residential areas. And there's often a, a misalignment, it seems to me, of stakeholder objectives in this area as well. So um, just to end, this is my final slide. What I've done is outline a whole range of things that we can do to improve the efficiency of road haulage and, and reduce its environmental impact. What we need then is to increase awareness of these measures and uh, encourage wider adoption. Now, the survey that we did uh, last year um, of the 800 carriers across Europe, um, what that found was that there was much greater awareness of the managerial and the IT related options than there were of the technical hardware options uh, as well, but, but, but it, with many of these options, that awareness was not great. And, and so there's a need, I think, to inform many carriers of, of what can be done here. Um, now, there are tools available. There's an online tool. This is one example um, constructed by the Centre for Sustainable Road Freight in the UK, um, which I think has about 28 initiatives that carriers can introduce. Uh, to cut fuel consumption and emissions. Um, it's called the SRF Optimizer. Um, and that's a rough and ready tool that companies can use um, to get some indication of what the um, environmental and commercial impact would be of applying these measures. Indeed, the results of that um, analysis uh, were referred to by the UK government and its freight carbon review back in uh, 2017. So, so we now have tools available really to assist this process of decarbonisation and energy improvements. Um, so so th th we, there's plenty of potential, it seems to me, to um, make better use of vehicle capacity and, and improve fuel efficiency. Um, but maybe along the way, we should also show a little bit more affection for these uh, things that we call lorries. Um, I hope you found that of interest. There's my, because of my contact details, I'll happily answer any questions that you have. And I published a book on decarbonizing logistics in 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McKenna. A lot of food for thought there in relation to decarbonisation and, and the broader agenda, and particularly looking at the operational efficiencies watered down. We've seen a lot of research in terms of technology development over the last couple of years. And um, we have a couple of questions. Um, if I go through them, if I could put them to you. Um, we have from Faye Carroll, very informative presentation. Thank you, Alan. Curious whether you have a sense which lower emitting technology, electric, hydrogen, biogas, et cetera, might come to the fore in the HGV sector and in what time scale, or will it be a mix of different technology, technologies? That's a, a big subject. I didn't say anything at all about that. Um, uh, we, we have this uh, range of options available and you, you've outlined them. The other one which you didn't mention was electrifying the highway, you know, to get power directly from overhead. Um, I, I think all of these technologies will make a contribution. The question is, um, what will be the relative contribution and, and, and what time scale will they be delivered? Um, I, 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 um, my preference is, is for batteries. I think the battery electric truck is going to dominate. Um, and, and I think in those countries with uh, the larger countries, the longer length of haul, I think there'll be a potential for electrifying the highway as well. I think it will require a big capital investment, but that will pay off over the longer term. Um, I, I'm not a big enthusiast for hydrogen, I have to say. I know there's, there's a very strong hydrogen lobby these days. I'm, I have two concerns about hydrogen. Um, one is that uh, how long it's going to take us to produce green hydrogen, because most of the hydrogen currently is essentially a fossil fuel made with, with methane. Um, the, uh, and, and the second thing is that once we do have uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen produced with low carbon electricity, you waste a lot of electricity in the process. You, you can lose about 70% of that original low carbon energy in, in making the green hydrogen. Um, so, so I still think there's a, a role for it. I think hydrogen will offer advantage over longer distances. Um, and there's less of a weight penalty, I think, also with the hydrogen vehicle. So it will have a role, but, um, but, but maybe a, a, a smaller one as well. I think it will also vary from country to country depending on the size of the country and the nature of the road haulage operation. So there's no one size fits all here. As for timescales, um, I mean, the, I think the truck manufacturers are expected to start mass producing these vehicles by the, the second half of this decade. Uh, the question then is, what is going to be the rate of uptake? 
of these vehicles. And that, that was why my figures on the replacement rate, I think, are quite relevant. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for that. We have a second question from Marion. Uh, thanks to Professor McKinnon um, for this very interesting and informative presentation. What sort of study would you see as most effective in tracking volumetric loading and what are the option, optional points at which volumetric data could be recorded? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. Um, I mean, this is the holy grail, really, for us uh, road freight researchers to get a handle on, on just how well vehicles are loaded in volumetric terms. Um, we did a study for the UK government uh, almost 20 years ago now, and we looked at the different ways in which you could do this, um, involving things like getting students to go into trucks with meter sticks and try to measure the height of loads and so forth. Thankfully, I mean, technology is working through our advantage. I mean, it is possible now to put sensors into the vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we also are getting better volumetric data on the loads that are going onto the vehicles. You know, the pallet loads, the cases, we know their, their dimensions. And, and so if you capture that data, again, you, you can get an estimate of, of just how much space within the vehicle is actually filled. Um, but the trouble is getting governments to do this. Right. So until recently, the UK government in its annual road freight survey did ask hauliers to what extent a load was constrained by weight, by volume or by both. Unfortunately, that, that question was discontinued. Um, and, and most other countries or the or Eurostat do not collect volumetric data. So once we've found a system of doing this at a macro level, it will give us a better sense of what the potential is for cutting emissions and fuel consumption by just filling the vehicle better in volumetric terms. Okay, thank you. And we also just have a question whether the presentation will be shared. I think that should be okay. We can do that. Yes, to just yes. After. I, I, yes I'll put it on my website as well, but I'll make it available to the organisers of the webinar if they want to circulate it. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, just a point to note that there is also a smart driving training centre by QQI and just the link then into the chat box as well for people who might be interested in that. Um, I have just one question for you, if, if I may, since we have a two minutes uh, left. I noticed you referred um, back to the Freight Best Practice Programme, and I'm curious in terms of the, your thoughts, in terms of the structure of the industry with so many small players in, in the industry. And you talked about, you know, encouraging change and support and informative them. I wonder, did you have any thoughts in terms of how you would maybe look at that from a policy perspective, how we, we would necessarily look to encourage that? Um, do you think the Freight, pra pra Freight Best Practice Programme might be um, and another mechanism maybe to stimulate this change element? Yeah. yeah, excellent question. Yeah, I mean, the UK Fake Best Practice Programme, which I thought was pioneering, existed for about 10 years. It was discontinued in 2010 as part of the government's austerity measures here in the UK. And, and I know at that stage, one of the complaints about it was that it wasn't reaching the long tail of small carriers. It tended to be the medium sized bigger ones, um, and, and, and somehow the message wasn't getting across to the smaller ones. And um, I mean, across Europe, there are 550,000 trucking companies, right? 80% of them have one or two vehicles. It's a big challenge, you know, in, you know, in, in forming and encouraging such a huge population of carriers. I think it's multi-stakeholder. I think government has a role to do, to go here. And, and recreating something like the Fake Best Practice Programme or creating it in Ireland, I think would be beneficial. Uh, the other thing is procurement, because as I said, a lot of road haulage these days is subcontracted by the big logistics providers, right? So they have a role to play in, in outsourcing the haulage operation, in managing that process. Um, I, I mentioned the Smart Freight Centre in my, my comments. The Smart Freight Centre last year published um, a report on the procurement of freight transport services. Um, giving companies advice on how they can do that in an environmentally friendly way to, okay. to incentivize the carriers. So I think it's not just a national matter for government, I think it's also a matter for the logistics providers and, and even the vehicle manufacturers, it seems to me, have a role to play here in informing the operators on how best to operate the vehicles to maximize efficiency and minimize emissions. OK, thank you very much for that. We're bang on the button to 10.55, so we'll stick to our schedule. It was very informative, and thank you for your comprehensive answers. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, so we will go over to our next presenter. It's Mark B.A., a Senior Advisor of, for Goods Transport at IRU, and he's going to present to us European perspectives and the EU-wide HGV driver shortage, another very important and topical point. Um, so Mark, if you have some slides, would you like to share your screen? Indeed, Owen, that's coming up now. Lovely, thank you. I will also put it in presentation mode to make that even more visible. And good morning to everybody. Um, I am Mark B.A. I work at the permanent delegation of the IRU to the European Union in Brussels. Now, the IRU is the global road transport organization representing employers. We have a mix of members, associations, as well as transport companies. Overall, we represent something like 3.5 million companies worldwide. We are active in a very wide range of subjects. And at the core of our philosophy is to try to improve the dialogue and the cooperation between the industry and governments at different levels so that the entire society can benefit more from what road transport has to offer. Now, I have been asked to provide a little bit of a European perspective on the consultation document. Now, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Irish government with this consultation document, because this uh, consultation document is an important dialogue starter with industry and with other stakeholders on how to make things better for everybody. So uh, well done. Now, when looking at the role of road freight transports in the European Union, when we look at land transports, about 72% on average is carried by trucks. Now, when we look at the Irish situation, Ireland is way above average with 99% being carried by trucks. So the haulage sector in the Republic of Ireland is of fundamental importance to the economy and to society as a whole. Now, what is also so specific for Ireland is its geographic situation. And also the fact, because of this geographic situation, that it is very reliant on the companies actually established in the Republic to carry out the services and carry the goods to customers. Now, looking at the entire situation, we are in a very special circumstance for the moment. We still have COVID-19 around and everybody knows that facilitation measures have been introduced for trucks to be able to continue to run the famous green lane principles. Now, because of the famous green lane principles, everybody thinks that, ah, it's business as usual, the trucks are running, but nothing is less true. We can see that we have some very serious GDP drops and we have some very serious reduced economic activity in the road haulage sector. And overall, we can see that there is about a 13% revenue loss in total. Now, when you also see uh, and compare the road transport sector, for example, with air freight, you see that the air freight sector is doing much better. Why is the air freight sector doing much better? Because there was a much wider recognition by European government that the air freight sector was in trouble and massive support was actually uh, introduced to help it above and you see as a result we see in the road transport sector that on a general basis 
member states tend to forget that road transport should also be a fundamental part in the whole recovery plan to get the economy, the industry out of the negative impact of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, when we look at it even from a wider perspective, notwithstanding this very special COVID-19 situation, the European institutions think that in much of their planning and their policy development, it's business as usual. When we look at the decarbonization plans, the greening plans, the digitalization plans, it's business as usual. For the industry is not, but there is a lot of expectations from uh, towards the industry. And we need to put this really into perspective. And I'm not going to repeat what Alan already explained in terms of possibilities and so on. I just want to pinpoint a number of things that are very important. Now, when we look at decarbonization of road transport, we need a wide range of solutions. There's no what, one single solution that will solve everything. And believe it, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> zero emission vehicles, it's a myth. It doesn't exist. There will always be emissions somewhere along the process. And in order to measure the, the, the emissions of logistics chains involving road transport and other modes and other activities, we need a well-to-wheel approach rather than simply a, a tailpipe approach. Now, diesel in the industry is not easy to replace and, and the report recognizes this, but how can we do it? And how can we do it in an easy, acceptable way? We need immediate, intermediate and long-term actions. We need to think widely ahead. And we see in the, uh, many European countries, the industry has engaged with other stakeholders and with governments to provide advice and guidance on how transport companies can actually gain in greening and also grain, gain in their wallet. Because greening, as Alan already said, is also very much cost savings and possibilities to further develop companies. And we look at vehicle technology, vehicle maintenance, different types of fuels, load factor, load capacity, and also driver training and helping the driver to actually deal, drive the vehicle and operate. Now, what has also been mentioned is the dialogue with other stakeholders, with the customers, with the shippers. We need to encourage and raise awareness that a mentality change is needed. Price concentration needs to disappear. More aspects, greening aspects, need to be taken into account when prices are being negotiated and prices are being set. It is impossible to expect from the road haulage as, uh, uh, industry that the entire burden of the decarbonization can be absorbed by the industry itself. It needs to be a shared approach and eventually society will have to foot the bill. That is something that we cannot actually uh, go around. What is needed is a positive incentivization to encourage companies to take action. And I fully agree that especially the small and the medium-sized enterprises need to be positively encouraged and potentially be offered tailor-made solutions on how they can increase the greening of their operations. Now, on top of these challenges relating to greening and digitalization, we unfortunately have the departure from the, of the UK from the European Union. Now, we have a good agreement and it's extremely positive, but there are many, many remaining challenges. When we look, for example, at trade, in February this year, imports from the UK were down 47%. When we look at exports to the UK, they were still down 15%. Now, the TCA 
can be improved in many ways, and this has to be done gradually. But one of the very important aspects that the TCA is not looking at is the multimodality and the unaccompanied transport, which are a very important business concept for the Irish industry. Now, we also see that the transport companies were not as well prepared as they should have been because they had been often left out of consultations on trade related aspects such as customs clearance, sanitary and phytosanitary procedures, where they are not directly involved, but where, for example, shortcomings can have an important impact on their operations. We see also a very important increase in the bureaucratic burden, and we see cost increases overall over 10% and important reduced operational flexibility. We see increased waiting times at borders, and we see uncoordinated controls, immigration, customs, everything is disconnected. Security concerns also continue. The illegal immigration challenge has not, towards the UK has not ended. What we see as a consequence is that drivers increasingly are unwilling to work on routes towards the UK, and we also see that because of the new situation, companies have also stopped working with the United Kingdom. So here again, we see an important impact on the road haulage sector. The European Union is currently uh, negotiating a Brexit adjustment reserve, and it is definitely important to consider that road haulage might also have to be included in. Uh, this Brexit adjustment reserve deployment in order to alleviate the negative impact um, on the sector. Now, further facilitation will definitely be needed in the operations between the European Union countries and uh, the United Kingdom. And Ireland, because of its position, is very much important in playing a key role in this perspective. Now moving on to the mobility packages, and yet again, the mobility packages were agreed in 2020 in the middle of the COVID-19, so that is yet another very important change that is affecting the industry uh, European-wide. The mobility package rules, they are absolutely not perfect. What we can see is that some of the aspects will actually create greater differences between companies established in the center countries and companies established in the periphery countries. What we have to try and go for is a harmonized implementation and application of the rules across the European Union. And creating the clarification of those new rules is very important. There are many unclear, difficult, complex provisions in the rules, and they need to be clarified. We as IRU, we are closely working together with the European Commission to get these clarifications. But it is also important that national governments and control authorities sit around the table with their whole age sector to actually seek clarifications and make the compliance much easier. Uh, for the industry. Looking at the uh, obligatory return home of the vehicle, this is a very controversial uh, new rule. It will affect those countries that have extremely long business cycles away from the country of establishment and business cycles, especially longer than eight weeks. Those companies returning home on a regular basis will not be so much affected by this new obligation. Um, enforcement, as already said, is also important. Enforcement is important to encourage compliant companies, okay? And to discourage non-compliant companies. It does not necessarily need to be more enforcement. It needs to be targeted enforcement, intelligence-led enforcement, which is important.
encouragement of dig digitalization, and that's also a new thing that has been opened by the mobility package, is also of fundamental importance to, importance to reduce uh, administrative burden, and also, as Alan said, to reduce the environmental footprint of the industry. Now, last night, we have a new deal on road charging rules between the European Parliament and the Council. Now, frankly speaking, there has always been a willingness on the side of the industry to pay for good road infrastructure, but not necessarily to get their cross uh, their uh, contributions to cross subsidize into other modes. What we do uh, not want to see is an overall increase in the tax burden placed on the industry and therefore compensations should be thoroughly but very thoroughly uh, considered. We do, to the contrary of a lot of other stakeholders, we have serious questions about the introduction of this CO2 emission rate variation. Why? Because that will lead to an implementation in different speeds across the European Union. And that is, in our view, not the right way to address potential decarbonization in the industry. Now, this brings me to uh, the key uh, and the core of the presentation, and that is the skills shortage and the uh, driver shortage situation in the industry. I have been active for close to 30 years in the industry, and the issue of driver shortage has always been there. It has never actually disappeared from the map whatsoever. Now, here you actually see uh, an overview of the situation in Europe uh, in 2020, and it must be said that the driver shortage challenge has been slightly alleviated in 2020, but it's the wrong signal. In 2021, with the uptake of the economy again, uh, the driver shortage and the skills gaps are back like never before. So uh, this situation could cause a very, very serious bottleneck situation in the provision and the supply of road haulage services. Going a little bit deeper into uh, the matter, we see that the driver shortage uh, can be expected to increase with about 25% or a quarter in 2021 as compared to 2020. In some uh, countries, we even see that the skills gap is even bigger. In some countries, we see skills gaps, for example, in Spain of about 150%, okay? We see also that most of the workforce in road haulage, most of the drivers are above 55. Only 5% of the professional drivers in the EU are younger than 25. Now, COVID-19 is again an important factor in uh, the impact of the uh, on the driver uh, situation. First of all, we had a, an increased reluctance of drivers to work because of scare of contamination. More scare was created because of the difficult working conditions and the many restrictions that were actually imposed in different countries and the extra requirements, extra conditions to comply with, not only in the countries itself, but also with the customers loading and unloading. We also see that the administrative prolongation of different kinds of certificates, whereas this was a very important alleviation element, could create also a bottleneck if the return to normal 
is not properly managed because uh, when people will have to start following training actually to go to join the sector or follow training courses in order to comply with continuous driver training conditions, this famous code 95, that could create classroom bottlenecks. So actually the facilitation of digital training, virtual training is absolutely important. Now, um, we see uh, that many drivers also during the COVID-19 pandemic have actually left the sector and will be very difficult to actually gain back. And talking to the Irish uh, Road Haulage Association, which is a very important member of IRU, we see that some companies in Ireland are actually facing reduced capacities of up of 20 to 25% due to their difficulties in getting good drivers. Now, what can we actually do to try and alleviate all this? Now, getting the drivers into the industry is easier said than done. I'm saying this because if it would have been easy, the problem wouldn't be there or the challenge wouldn't be there. So it is a challenging, but I think we all need to work together here to get this done. Firstly, in order to be able to address the problem, it is important to be able to quantify the challenge. And we have introduced regular surveys internationally on getting feedback on the situation in various countries, not only in Europe, but worldwide. We also see an important development in what is being required in terms of skills from professional drivers. And also the rules and regulations have become fundamentally stricter and more burdensome. We also see that there is a bridge, an important bridge to be laid to cross the gap between school leaving and entering into the, into the profession. Now, lowering the driver age is one of the things that is definitely good to do, but there also needs to be important cooperation with education, but also with other institutions to see how we can actually ensure the through flow of interested people into the driver profession. And we see, for example, that we have a fundamental change in, fun in driver recruitment in many European uh, countries since the end of army conscription. Because many youngsters, when they joined the army for a year or a year and a half, one thing they did, they got a C license during their army service, okay? And then they could easily start driving a truck. This is not necessarily the case anymore today, but you still see, for example, like in the Netherlands, the Netherlands, our member associations, uh, TLN and Evo Fenidex, <coughs> excuse me, they are in contact with the armed services in the Netherlands to see how people who have joined the army on a temporary basis can then potentially flow through to the uh, road haulage and logistics uh, sector. So uh, we also need to look at how the training of drivers can be incentivized. Initial recruitment to join the sector and also the continuous training of drivers, because we see that this is expensive. It is expensive for drivers to actually uh, prepare for the uh, profession. Improving working conditions is also a fundamental aspect. And we're looking at, for example, the improvement of facilities along the road network to take rests, 
uh, to take their uh, daily breaks, to take their reduced weekly breaks, and so on and so on. It's very important. It's not, it's, we also have to look very much at, at the gender equality here, okay? Because the facilities are not always available for the women in the same way as they are available also for the male drivers. So that is also something that we have to address uh, because it, it is incredibly important to try and attract also more women drivers into the, in, into the sector. We also have to look at to how cooperation with the other stakeholders in the logistics chain can be improved, especially in terms of treatment of drivers, for example, at loading and unloading places. We have seen, for example, in, in, in the COVID-19, we've had many complaints about drivers being unjustifiably treated uh, at loading and unloading places, but this was not only limited to COVID-19. So uh, a better treatment, a, a more respect of the driver is absolutely fundamental because the driver is not only a driver anymore. The driver is actually the ambassador of the industry. It's, it's the face of the industry towards the customers, towards society. Okay, we also see that a number of member states have recognized the uh, driver profession as a bottleneck profession, making it easy for those member states to actually provide additional support to attract more people into the uh, profession. Very important is we have to monitor also the developments in the industry, anticipate change, and its impacts on the driver profession in order to <coughs> make sure that drivers do not leave because of these developments. And one of the important developments here is the uh, move towards the use of more autonomous vehicles. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to a number of conclusions. The road haulage sector, as already said, is vital for the European and also Irish economy and society. It is a very highly regulated sector. It is even over-regulated with over 150 EU directives and regulations impacting the industry on a daily basis. And it's still increasing. Now, the sector is unique because it is extremely flexible and it is extremely customer oriented. Therefore, it's fundamental role also to the economy and to society. When we actually like start looking at helping the sector and at developing the sector, it is incredibly important to look as far ahead as possible. Not only look at tomorrow, look at the intermediate and the long-term consequences. This is very often overlooked, not only by the European Union, but by the various member states as well, that the long-term perspective is absent. Now this, doing all this can best be done by a very close and continued cooperation between government and the industry in all aspects of policymaking, implementation and application of rules and regulations. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm, I'm quite <clears throat> conscious of the time. We're running a little bit over, but maybe we could get your views on one comment slash question we have in the chat box. A um, question um, from or comment from Jerry. I am deeply concerned that the manner of dealing with the driver shortage is import drivers from outside the EU when we have an average of 15% youth unemployment in Europe. Um, that is where we should be looking as they were our original source over the years. We need to look at what has happened. Just wonder your views on that one, Mark. Well, um, we see that there is a lot of international trade in professional drivers. Western European countries recruit drivers in the new member states. The new member states, they recruit drivers in third countries. Now, this is 
to fill gaps, but you have to also be aware of the consequences. And I think Jerry has a very important point. Drivers that are not used to the market in where they have to work tend to have problems. And we see that, that companies that are using drivers that do not come from their own country, they have the language barriers, they are not used to the mentality, they're not used to the customers, though, so they have much more difficulties to actually fit in. They are also not familiar with the local rules and regulations applicable, and also not necessarily familiar with the driving conditions in a certain country. And I'm not sure if anybody is familiar to, uh, with the program uh, Ice Road Rescue uh, in, in Norway, where you see uh, what uh, hauliers have to face with in winter conditions. Now, mm -hmm. if those trucks are drive, driven by uh, drivers that are not familiar, not trained to do these type of operations, that's a problem. Now, we also must say that recruiting driver from third countries might have a skills challenge. You have to make sure that those people also have the right skills and also the right immigration uh, documents to be, actually, to be actually in a position to work properly in the European Union. We have recently seen some complaints from companies being based in the European Union using third country drivers on the routes to the UK. Now, those third country drivers now need visa yeah. to get into the UK and the UK is posing problems granting those visas in a fast and orderly manner. Okay, so that Mark, is again causing pro uh, bottlenecks. Thank you, Mark. Sorry, I'm just conscious of time. And there probably are another couple of questions, but we may have to come back to those after the webinar. So thank you very much for your presentation and, and your comprehensive answer um, to those particular questions. Um, so on our schedule, we're due to take a short break. Uh, maybe we'll just take uh, six or seven minutes if we <coughs> take, take a break and we come back at 11.35 for our next presenter. So thank you. We'll see you soon. <laughs>